Thanks, Alex. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming out today. Thank you, uh, uh, C-SPAN, as well. No boos when they mentioned Harvard University. That's, uh, that's very good. That's very, very open of you. That's uh, good to hear. Um, uh, and thank you to the Stanford Review for, uh, for inviting me back to, to Stanford. I haven't been here in a, uh, in a while. Uh, I graduated from Stanford in 1996, and the last time that I was here at Stanford, it cost me about $100,000, um, and they confiscated my, uh, my drugs, uh, which I used to get through <laughs> high school. So I'm a, little, I'm a little suspicious, a little bit leery now, being back on campus. But for the most part, I'm happy to be here. Um, I remember back in 1996 just how different the world seemed. It actually tried to uh, – I wanted to be the commencement speaker back in 1996, uh, if you can believe it. They, in fact, they went with uh, Mae Jameson, who had been a NASA astronaut for about six years. So I guess she deserved it. They'd had William Perry the year before. So there's a fairly high standard, and uh, I obviously didn't meet that standard. Um, but I remember writing the speech back in 1996 and trying to lay, you know, I'm trying to lay out a – a worldview for the next five or ten years and, and giving advice to my classmates. And uh, I actually dug up the old speech and, uh, and just, you know, I had a couple of, a couple of paragraphs just kind of resonated. Um, in that speech, I actually predicted that an interconnected network of high-speed fiber optics would emerge the next couple of years and create a window to the, uh, to the uh, world on every desktop and completely revolutionize the way that we download pornography, or that we view pornography. <laughs> I think I pretty much got that one. Uh, I actually laid out a case back then for why the most successful governor, the most successful governor in, in California, in our generation, uh, would be an actor, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yeah, shoot, I actually got that one wrong, I guess. Um, I even wrote a note to the Boston Red Sox saying that they should probably draft this rookie named Nomar Garcia Parra, that he could be pretty good, and that uh, they should look at trading for a pitcher named Pedro, little brother from Ramon Martinez. He could be pretty good, too. Uh, but I remember telling the Red Sox in that speech that they should pull Pedro in Game 7 of a playoff game against the Yankees if his pitch count ran to 105. <laughs> and uh, they obviously didn't take my, uh, didn't take my advice. Uh, but boy, I tell you, 1996, was, it just feels like a whole different world back then. And, and for most of the, the freshmen in this audience, you guys would have been, what, like um, about eight years old back then? So it would have been uh, uh, maybe about 10 years old. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's remarkable to think how I used to, when I used to teach economics at Harvard, the, the freshmen were, you know, probably about your age. And uh, it, seemed, it seemed like a whole paradigm shift, having people growing up in the 1980s. Uh, after, um, after Reagan was elected in 1980 and after the malaise of the 1970s was uh, very interesting. Having them come of age in the 1990s and trying to teach economics to them was, uh, uh, was pretty tricky. Um, just as a, as a thought experiment, does anyone know in this room before 1980, before Reagan was elected, what was the top tax rate in the United States? Federal tax rate. 70%. 70%? Any other guesses? 72. 72? You guys are a very well-informed bunch. It actually was. It actually was 70 70 percent. Uh, today we're at 35 percent, and it just seems like a whole world away. How could we possibly have a 70 percent tax rate in you know in, in the land of the free? Does anyone in this room believe that if we'd had a 70 percent federal tax rate and a 10 percent state tax on top of that, so really 80 percent confiscatory tax rates in the state of California, does anyone here believe that we would have had the same Silicon Valley revolution and entrepreneurship and innovation that drove the wealth of the 1980s and 90s? Anyone? So you're all supply siders, which is great. Because in the 1970s, we were all Keynesians. A uh, whole, different, whole different game. Yeah, yeah. Nevada would have, would have been better. It at least would have been, it wouldn't have had the state income tax. But, but 70% seems remarkable. I think we owe a lot to Ronald Reagan as a result. And, in, and at a 70% tax rate, you can just imagine uh, the, uh, the economic power that was unleashed in the 1980s as a result of those, of those Reagan-led reforms. Um, it's somewhat galling to me, then, that this is going to be about the fifth election in a row, certainly the fourth election in a row, when the economy has cut against the Republicans, and their management of the economy has been uh, generally quite good. Uh, and yet, uh, if you look at how polls perceive people and how they vote on the economy, Democrats seem to get more points on that issue than the Republicans do. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about the economy today, which is what my chapter was about, and a little bit about Iraq, and, uh, and hopefully that will foster some, some, some dialogue and some thoughts. Uh, let me actually start with, uh, with Iraq, because I think that's in some ways the more, you know, the more uh, interesting issue. And I'm just trying to think about what Eric said about this, and um, so I want to get my thoughts out there while I have them. 
and maybe that'll spark a, a dialogue. I don't really want to draw a contrast between Bush and Kerry on Iraq, because I don't actually know how they defer all that much. Kerry, to me, seems like he wants the same things that George Bush does on Iraq. He just he wants to win the war with fewer troops and with some kind of international coalition that will emerge just because he's president. I don't know what's going to prompt the French or the Germans to send troops to Iraq to die just because Kerry gets elected, but that seems to be John Kerry's position. So let me give you some general thoughts on Iraq, and maybe that'll, um, that'll, that'll uh, lead to some interesting questions later on. Uh, we live in a, uh, in a democratic age. Back in 1900, not a single country in the world practiced what we would call democracy, universal adult suffrage. Uh, in 1824, only 2% of British citizens were eligible to vote. Uh, in that same year, uh, only 5% of adult Americans voted in the federal election, the presidential election at that time, which featured uh, John Quincy Adams and, and Andrew Jackson. Throughout the 1800s, there was a certain expansion of the right of suffrage, but even as late as the 1920s and 1930s, uh, we didn't have universal adult suffrage. The 1930s finally saw it happen in the UK with women being allowed to vote. The United States, at least in theory, was there, but blacks were disenfranchised as late as 1970. They, couldn't, they didn't really vote uh, and were disenfranchised in the South. Uh, another interesting historical point, again, you know, you guys are... Uh, I, I gave you the Reagan example, but, but think about the expansion of human liberty just in our lifetimes, or just at least in my lifetime, and I was, I was born in the mid-70s. The, uh, anyone know the year when schools in the South were desegregated by a Supreme Court, a Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education? Good guess, 54. 54, pretty late. I mean, your parents were alive back then. Uh, Loving versus Virginia, uh, a state court a case in Virginia, um, actually overturned state laws on, on miscegenation or anti-miscegenation laws, meaning blacks and whites can't marry. This is 13 or 12 or 13 states in the United States sat this on the books. Anyone know what your Loving versus Virginia was? You got the first, it sounded like you had... 73 is a pretty good guess, 1968. As late as 1968, blacks and whites can't get married in, in big chunks of the United States. So we are, at, we are in a remarkable age. I think all this just seems completely foreign and ridiculous to us. And I think, I'll, I think my kids will probably look back on me and say, you know, you lived in a pretty totalitarian, repressive regime yourself back in the 1990s or the early 2000s. <laughs> you know, gays couldn't get married or uh, marijuana was illegal. What kind of a police state were you guys in, you bunch of Nazis? Um, I don't know. I don't actually know what those, what those defining civil rights issues are. But I, just, I understand that we're in a momentous shift and an expansion of liberty um, and this is, this is important because of what it means for Iraq. The expansion of democracy has now spread so that 120 countries are quote-unquote democracies. But many of them are what I would call illiberal, illiberal democracies. Um, I'll give an example. The um, democracy, literally since Herodotus wrote about it uh, back in 4th f- you know, century uh, Athens, democracy essentially means uh, rule of the people. And Back in 4th century, uh, you know, Athens, when Athenian democracy was at the height um, of, its, uh, of its power and its respect, uh, Socrates was put to death by a democratically elected legislature, mainly because he was annoying people. So it, Athens was a democracy, but it was not liberal, meaning it didn't have the rule of law and the protections of individual rights and equality, equality before the law and it didn't have those basic protections of separated government that, that we take for granted today. And it, there's a tremendous rush, I think, in Iraq and elsewhere in the world to impose democratic elections onto the societies there and, and then run and, and essentially retrench and become more isolationist. Um, Bush, to some extent, has actually exhibited this problem. I think Kerry does it all the time. Uh, certainly the United Nations does this. So I'm not necessarily picking sides here. But if we rush to elections in Iraq, what, what would happen? There's a good chance in the Middle East that a, you know, a kleptocracy, a, an, Islamic, um, an Islamo-fascist majority emerges and wins the election. And that's, you know, that's not a liberal democracy. The n- a number of countries have gone through this before. Well, Hitler, Germany in the 1930s, through a free and fair election process, put a dictator in power. Uh, Chile, Venezuela, Peru, um, you know, Spain, a number of countries have, have elected uh, tyrants and fascists and authoritarians and done so in free and fair elections. So the point, I think, in Iraq is not to actually have uh, free and fair elections, but actually pursue political and economic reforms uh, that engender liberal democracy. 
And I think the, 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 the sequence really is first establish economic rights and then establish political rights. In fact, the political rights will follow. Just ask, you know, Chile or Mexico or South Korea or Singapore or China. Um, 